And just like with the luminescent detectors, if you have a material that will change in some way, depending on the amount of energy deposited in it by the radiation, then you can look at how that material changes to determine how much energy was deposited, to determine the dose. And so radiochromic materials will actually call, change their color depending on the amount of dose that they receive. So of course you've heard ionizing radiation can cause biological damage, alpha and beta particles mostly through ingestion, x-rays and gamma rays mostly from external sources. Um, and so what scientists would like to do, especially within say medical physics or health physics with hospitals and for treatment, is they would like to be able to have some sort of a 3D dosimeter that they could run through a mock treatment to actually verify their treatment plan for things like cancer, where they can put this into the um, radiation producing instrument, the um, gamma knife or whatever, and verify three-dimensionally that their, trans that their uh, treatment plan would work for the patient. And so for a 3D dosimeter, what we would like to have is we'd like it to be transparent. We'd like light to be able to pass through it completely. Um, it should be solid without a container. It should be tissue-like, so it should have an effective Z kind of close to um, carbon and water and uh, glucose and everything else. Um, it should be radiochromic, meaning there should be a color response. It should be sensitive to the range of treatment doses up to about one gray of dose. It shouldn't be sensitive to oxygen, so it shouldn't um, degrade or anything like that over time. Of course, it should be linear, independent of the dose rate. So no matter how fast you deposit the dose, it should respond in the same way. Um, batch to batch or piece to piece, it should be reproducible, it should be stable, and hopefully cheap, because you'd like to be able to run one of these each time you wanted to verify a treatment plan. And so there's a group at Rutgers University that came up with this material called Presage, and it uses polyurethane raw materials, a radiochromic compound like a leuco dye, um, and a free radical initiator, a solvent. It's created under pressure to prevent the formation of bubbles, and you can create dosimeters in size ranging from one gram up to greater than five kilograms. And that one picture there, I have a couple blow-ups on the next slide, but that one picture there, you might see like a mock-up of a person's head, okay? So you could put these into your um, treatment instrument. They do change colors. In the irradiated head, for instance, you can see the center of the head there. It's a light, little bit more blue and green. Um, you can do mock-ups for breast inserts. The reason why you would do that is for breast cancer, sometimes that's treated using seeds and where the seeds are made of radioactive materials. And you wanna verify where the dose from that seed is, would go to verify that it would actually treat the cancer and not other stuff. There's a cylinder there that's been irradiated and you can see some of those dark spots where the color has changed. Um, the next one there, the brachytherapy, that blue circle in the middle, that would be from that radioactive seed that gets implanted. The hemisphere, you, they, they've shown that you can target specific spots with your treatment or your irradiation. The micro beams, um, so they're showing that the material is very sensitive, that you can do these like line barcode kinds of things for resolution. They've got the picture down at the bottom showing that all the way up to say 70 grays, um, it's linear in terms of color change. You can just basically like apply Beer's Law to this. The, I threw a calibration curve graph on there. Um, the Luco dye that they use, you can think of it as being something similar to like crystal violet. I'm sure everybody's pretty much done the kinetics with crystal violet where it's purple and then you react it with a base and it becomes colorless, right? This kind of works in the opposite direction where it's colorless to start and as it's exposed to radiation dose and collects charge, um, that causes the color change in the molecule. So this is just pretty cool. Um, I thought it was neat that they were making these materials, that they are another way that you can measure or detect radiation, that you can also use it to um, do dose.
The way they actually use them, if you're curious, is they would put it into like a three-dimensional kind of photography system. And they can photograph it from all angles and then they run it through um, something basically just like computed tomography or CT, but they're doing it with optical pictures as instead of like x-ray pictures. And then they can build back up to see what their dose profile was. Um, and Lewis just linked in there a radiochromic film. So um, the electronics with all these detectors. So we've talked a lot about how the detectors work just in general, how radiation interacts within that volume. Now we are going to get some sort of an electrical signal out and we need to be able to collect that somehow. Um, these vary greatly depending on the type and the purpose of the detector. In general, the electronics are easier to set up um, and less expensive if all you're trying to do is count. Um, the electronics get more expensive and more involved to set up when you're trying to do spectroscopy or relate energy um, to your counts. Ionization chambers, um, we talked a little bit about this before. This is the one I wanted to spend a little bit of time on because you can use these to measure dose. The dose that's being uh, put into them is proportional to the current that you could measure, but the currents are minuscule. And so to get around that, what they do is they create a parallel RC circuit, which has a long time constant. At equilibrium, we know Ohm's law, V equals IR will hold, and um, the capacitance law, Q equals CV will hold. Across that capacitor, you can apply an AC voltage and that will cause the capacitance to vary rapidly. Um, I don't know much about AC. We, when I took physics, we pretty much just stuck with DC circuits and DC electricity. AC gets kind of weird, but it turns out that that alternating current that can vary the potential, um, that will then vary the capacitance. And what that does is that allows you to actually pull out or measure a constant current. I'm not quite sure how that works, but. That's the equation that they apply for these RC circuits. When the um, capacitance is varying sinusoidally, then your AC voltage ends up being proportional to current, and that AC voltage then is easier to um, amplify with the electronics. That it's easier to amplify potential than it is to amplify current. You could also choose to operate an ionization chamber in pulse mode. And this is basically the electronics that we're going to think of as applying to all of our other spectroscopy kinds of systems. And so in general, you have a preamplifier, which converts your charge into a potential that's converting typically a relatively small charge into a small potential. So we get about millivolts out from a preamplifier. That signal then goes to a regular amplifier where you're able to amplify millivolts to volts. This can also shape your pulse. You can say, okay, I want to reject or not pass along through the amplifier any pulses that are under one millivolt or um, that start too soon. So if your peak is going up and coming back down for your potential, then you can prevent stuff starting when your potential is still coming down. Then these go to more like a computer card typically, but these can also be set up with um, more electronics kind of in a box. An MCA is a multi-channel analyzer, and an ADC is an analog to digital converter. These are typically combined for say like computer cards, and they convert all of your peak voltages in volts, and that whatever the voltage is then corresponds to a bin number or a channel number, okay? This is for electronic data processing. You could also use a single channel analyzer with spectroscopy but they're just a little bit more tedious to work through and do data analysis with. There's a small number of cases where you might want to use those, but um, sometimes they're used because they're less expensive and you don't necessarily need a full-blown MCA to do your spectroscopy. Um, if you're using electronics to do counting, then we typically don't need a preamplifier. Like for Geiger-Muller counters, there's no preamplifier. You might include some sort of a discriminator to exclude electronic noise, but remember in many cases, we don't want to exclude background radiation. We'll still measure the background radiation so that we can correct or our counts. If you're doing spectroscopy, then you pretty much want all of the above. 
If you're doing spectroscopy with your sodium iodide thallium scintillator, then your MCA typically has just over 2,000 channels that you're binning all of your energies into from your radiation. If you have hyperpure germanium, that can be operated with either about 4,000 or 8,000 channels. Um, alpha spec, the number of channels you might choose varies a little bit more widely depending on what samples you're looking at or what kinds of applications you're looking at. So this is just kind of an introduction to the electronics. I know when you guys do the labs, typically in the pre-labs especially, you spend a lot more time talking specifically about the electronics that go into things like pulse height analysis. Um, when's that on the schedule? Have you seen that? Maybe Lewis will tell, type into the chat and tell me when you guys are doing the pulse height lab or when you first do spectroscopy. So basically choosing a detector, there's three factors. It can be cheap, fast, or good, but the old saying is, yeah, you can only choose two of those. So you can have it cheap and fast, but not so good. You can have it cheap and good, but slow. Or it can be fast and good, but expensive, okay? So um, this is just kind of a summary table, summarizing all of the kinds of detectors we've talked about. Um, the ionization chamber, the proportional, the Geiger-Muller, these were all gas-filled. In general, if the radiation gets into the detector, it's going to interact and the efficiency or the intrinsic efficiency would be 100%. But recall for these gas-filled detectors, they're not really going to be sensitive to gamma radiation. So if you were trying to look at gamma radiation, you would not want to use a Geiger counter or a proportional counter or an ionization chamber, okay? Are we allowed to say that efficiency can be 100%? Like Intrinsic like efficiency, really yes. Intrinsic, yes. Because of the beta and alpha particles themselves? Yes. If okay. an alpha particle makes it into an ionization chamber or a Geiger-Muller tube, it's going to interact. Now, do you think alpha particles are going to get into Geiger counters? You guys did that lab. What did the Geiger counter look like? Well, maybe you couldn't hold it, but... <laughs> I just remember from the week zero videos that like when you put it over an alpha source, it would just not do any, it wouldn't beep anymore. Right, because the alphas, for one thing, might get stopped in the air, right? For another thing, you've even, no matter how thin you make that window, it's still a solid, and the alpha particles still have very short range, okay? So alpha particles basically don't get into a Geiger counter, but you could sit an alpha source, you can put that into a proportional counter, but the proportional counter Basically, you put your sample into the counter itself. That's how proportional counters work. You've got a sample, it might be on a tray, that tray can slide, and then you've got some sort of a chamber that comes down over your sample, and then you flow your gas through and you collect your charge. An ionization chamber, you might be able to sit that right on top of an alpha source, and you might be able to get some of that. So basically, gas-filled detectors, unless you're doing proportional counting, Typically, especially the Geiger counters are really just used for beta, right? Um, the timing, so how long the dead time is, ionization chambers have very long dead times. Um, proportional counters, it's on the order of microseconds. Geiger-Muller counters, it's on the order of hundreds of microseconds. So it depends specifically on the gas and what your cations are doing. Resolution, are you trying to do energy resolution? Are you trying to do spectroscopy? It's okay with an ionization chamber, but I wouldn't want to do spectroscopy with one. Proportional counters, basically all you can do is resolve the type of radiation. You can say whether it was an alpha or a beta. You have no resolution with a Geiger-Muller counter, okay? Liquid scintillation counters are great for alpha and beta detection, especially at lower energies. They have okay resolution. Again, you could do some spectroscopy. You might be able to tell the difference between an alpha particle that came from curium versus from americium, but you wouldn't want to get in and try to fingerprint specifically americium and say, oh, these are all the alpha particles from americium. Liquid scintillation has a much shorter timing for dead time, so on the order of nanoseconds. Again, the effi intrinsic efficiency is basically 100% because of your sample going right into that uh, scintillation cocktail. 
but this does depend on the energy of the radiation. So those betas that come from tritium, for instance, are so low energy that for trying to count tritium with liquid scintillation, your efficiency is only say 30%, okay? But that's gonna be way better than a Geiger counter. If you're trying to count tritium with a Geiger counter, the beta particles from tritium pretty much never make it into the Geiger counter. You might have like one in 100,000 betas that make it there. So liquid scintillation is pretty much always used for counting tritium. Sodium iodide, hyperpure germanium, these are your two choices pretty much for gamma spectroscopy. There are other materials out there. People have worked on creating new scintillating materials. Um, the resolution of sodium iodide is okay. It's fine as long as you're not trying to resolve things that are like tens of EV apart. Um, hyperpure germanium has great resolution. And you'll see a couple pictures at the end of the slides. The timing for both of these is on the order of nanoseconds. Um, efficiency for sodium iodide about 8%. The efficiency for hyperpure germanium is less than sodium iodide if the crystal is the same size. So you could of course make a larger germanium crystal that matches the efficiency of the sodium iodide. Surface barrier or ion implanted detectors, that's a different type of semiconductor. Good for alpha and beta, great resolution, but again, it depends a little bit on the specific detector. Um, the temperatures maybe you have it cooled to. So if you're using silicon, for instance, and you were trying to do beta spectroscopy, you would still want to cool that detector. Um, the way that works for, say, alpha spectroscopy, again, is you would put your radioactive source into a chamber. You have your detector right above that source. But to make sure all the alpha particles get to your detector, you actually pull a vacuum on that chamber. So you put your sample into an airtight chamber that you can close up a door on and pull a vacuum on. The efficiency for those is about 100% as well. Our ideal detector would be sensitive to everything, would give us perfectly line resolution, like if you're thinking about doing atomic spectroscopy, the timing would be zero and it would be 100% efficient. So the ideal detector does not exist, okay? It's always a trade-off. You're always trying to decide between things. Any kind of questions from the summary before we get into spectroscopy stuff? Okay, so let's talk some about how we would actually go about interpreting spectra with some of our detectors. And so this is gonna be either sodium iodide or germanium or a surface barrier detector. Um, there will be a couple alpha ones in here as well. So let's kind of start off by thinking about an infinite volume detector. So we're gonna pretend that no matter what kind of radiation is coming into our detector, and we're pretty much focused on gamma rays right now, that our detector is gonna capture all energy from those incoming particles. So this is kind of where that mercury droplet question would come in. So if the droplet is infinitely large, then all of the gamma rays that come in are gonna interact within the mercury volume. And those gamma rays can interact through uh, Compton scattering, photoelectric effect, pair production, no matter how they interact, if it's photoelectric effect, well now you've created an electron that's got a lot of energy, and as that electron moves through the solid, it creates more ion pairs, those ion pairs get collected somehow, whether it's by causing light scintillation or whether it's through the semiconductor, okay? Compton scattering, if you scatter an electron, that electron still interacts that same way, your scattered gamma ray can interact in any of those other ways still. It could scatter again, make another electron somewhere else. It could interact through the photoelectric effect. Pair production, same thing. We're still basically producing electrons, an electron and a positron. When the electron moves, it deposits its energy. When the positron moves, it deposits its energy until it annihilates, and then forms gamma rays again, and then we restart. So we've got all these mechanisms that can occur and we wanna try and follow this through with each gamma ray within our detector. If we have an infinite volume detector such that all the energy from the incoming gamma ray is deposited, then we're only gonna end up with a single peak. Our spectra is gonna be pretty boring, but it would be great for identifying samples because every 
energy gamma ray that comes in is going to give us one single peak. Okay, this is the ideal case. Skinny line resolution where you've just got a line at every single energy would be ideal, but it's not realistic or observed in practice. Um, in some case, in some ways, it's limited by the uncertainty in the smallest number of information carriers. So we did that little exercise earlier where we calculated the relative uncertainty for germanium versus sodium iodide, and then talked about how that uncertainty would change with all of the changes in the sodium iodide. Um, you could think just for charge collection, if the electrons are moving on the order of the speed of light, they don't exactly have that speed, but let's just say they are moving that fast. How fast does it take for those electrons to get collected in a three inch crystal? And the answer is very short. Okay, so this is our timing with our, whether this is our uh, scintillation crystal or whether this is our semiconductor crystal. So if we shrink our detector, because it's not realistic to have an infinite volume. So we're going to have some realistic size for our detector. Okay. Um, quick question, um, yeah. if you don't mind. So the mercury drop was acting as the detector in that case? There, there wouldn't have been anything hooked up to it to detect the energy, but yeah, that was the idea I was trying to go for, was get you think about oh. how can the gamma rays interact with that solid. Okay. So you've got photoelectric, Compton scattering, pair production, and then what happens after each of those things. So if it's photoelectric, the gamma is gone, right? But then that electron is what deposits the energy. The electron, because it's a charged particle, is going to deposit more energy per length or distance than the gamma ray would have because it's a charged particle, right? So basically our goal with all of these detectors is to create charged particles. And even if we can only create one charged particle that carries all the energy, that's still gonna be our best bang for our buck, okay, in terms of being able to detect it. So if we shrink our detector down, okay, we're still gonna have a photo peak. We're still gonna have a peak where the gamma ray deposits all of its energy into a photoelectron. That photoelectron deposits all of its energy into the detector as it moves. We collect all of that energy either in the form of ion pairs or in the form of that scintillated light. Okay, so we're always going to end up with that photo peak, the energy of the gamma ray. But what happens with this small or real size detector is that if you have, say, a Compton scattering event, if that gamma ray comes in, collides with an electron, and scatters back at its maximum angle, so if it scatters at 180 degrees, if the gamma ray that scatters then proceeds to leave the detector without interacting again, then the only energy that gamma ray deposits in the detector is the energy that it gave to the scattered electron. We call this in spectra, we call it the Compton edge, but we can figure that out by using that equation for the Compton scattering, where we look at the energy remaining with the gamma ray, and we can figure out how much energy it transferred, okay? That energy transferred, recall, depends on the energy of the gamma ray coming in, but it was, and it, could vary from say 5% to 99% of the energy of the gamma ray, okay? So you can see this at different positions, but if you know the energy of the gamma ray coming in, you assume it scatters at 180 degrees, you can calculate the energy of the gamma ray that leaves the detector that was scattered, and the difference between the original energy and the scattered energy is the energy that it deposits, and we call that the Compton edge, okay? That's where I've got the arrows on this slide pointing at 180 degrees. Now that gamma ray can scatter at other angles, okay? But when that gamma ray scatters at other angles, it's gonna keep more of its energy to itself and it's going to de deposit less energy with the scattered electron. So that shape then on the spectra, that curved part is what we call the Compton continuum. So there's a whole range of possible scattering angles we can't say which specific ones happen. This kind of gets at the question from yesterday about the probabilities of interaction. And this was the shape I was thinking of when I was saying that I think 180 degrees is one of the more likely angles, okay? But again, this also depends on which angle the gamma rays 
scatter in and how likely those gamma rays are to leave the detector. So it's still possible that the scattered gamma ray could interact within the detector. And if the scattered gamma ray interacts within the detector, it could still deposit its full energy. And if it deposits its full energy, it still gets counted in that photo peak or the full energy peak. So no matter what, no matter how many interactions the gamma ray has, if it scatters 20 times, as long as that gamma ray scatters 20 times and then ends in a photoelectric conversion within the detector, the timing of that, it happens so fast that you're gonna collect all of those charge carriers all at once and you still count that one gamma ray in your photo peak, okay? We may have already covered this, but is there some sort of shield when the gamma ray does escape the detector we'll before it stop it? We'll get okay. there, okay, gotcha. yeah. Um, if you produce, um, if you have pair production, remember pair production is always gonna be, is always gonna require 1.022 MeV to occur. So if your gamma ray has more energy than that, then it's possible that it can produce a pair of an electron and a positron. If you produce a pair of an electron and a positron, when the positron annihilates, it's possible that both annihilation photons will leave the detector. Because both photons are 511 keV, that means you would lose 1022 keV of energy or 1.022 MeV. So 1.022 MeV below your photo peak is where you would expect to see a double escape peak from pair production, okay? So that's not gonna be related to a gamma ray energy, that's gonna be a loss of energy from your photo peak. Now you're only gonna see that escape peak if your original photon was more than 1.022 MeV, okay? If your original photon is less than 1.022 MeV, then you're typically just gonna see your photo peak and your Compton edge and Compton continuum. This is also still kind of idealized. If we look at a little bit more of a realistic spectra, you see multiple Compton events are gonna be able to deposit more energy than your Compton edge. And because that's gonna give you more energy in the detector, but maybe still not your full photo peak energy, that means you don't just see a peak and then flat zero and then Compton edge. It means that between your photo peak and the Compton edge, there's still gonna be some counts you detect where that gamma ray has scattered multiple times and has not deposited all of its energy in the detector, okay? That's again, still for less than 1.022 MeV gammas. Greater than 1.022 MeV gammas, you're still gonna see energy deposited from multiple scattering events, but you're also now gonna be able to see we're filling in here single and double escape peaks, okay? So single and double escape peaks are when maybe one of your annihilation photons from pair production deposits, it, deposits its energy in the detector but one escapes, okay? The single escape peak is just gonna be 511 keV less than your photo peak, okay? So, so far we've kind of covered what it looks like if the gamma ray deposits all of its energy in the detector, what happens if the gamma ray scatters at 180 degrees, what happens if the gamma ray scatters at some other angle, the multiple Compton events is the multiple scattering, and what happens if you're greater than one MeV and you happen to create pair production and you have some annihilation photons that leave. So we've tried to cover all of the possibilities that can happen from that one gamma ray that comes into the detector and interacts, okay? But as Karis asked a couple minutes ago, is it, can that gamma ray only interact within the detector? Is there anything else, else around the detector that the gamma ray might interact with? If you're doing sodium iodide, you might typically have that in some shielding to try to reduce background radiation. What do you think is a good material that a lot of people use to shield for radiation? Lead. Lead, okay. So let's say you've, 
built up some lead bricks around your detector. Well, what happens if the gamma ray hits one of your lead bricks? What could that gamma ray do within a lead brick? Produce breaking radiation. Could produce breaking radiation. Um, that would be if it's an electron. So if you had electrons hitting the lead, you could see the bremsstrahlung from it, right? Yeah. But for a gamma ray itself, the gamma ray isn't going to do bremsstrahlung. How can a gamma ray interact within materials? You can interact with the lead in the same way, can it? And just produce all the same effects. So give me one. Give me one. Oh, like, like a pair production or? So a pair production, right. So on this diagram here, that's number three. So from the source, your gamma ray that ha would then have to be greater than 1.022 MeV comes into the lead and in the lead, it produces a pair of electrons, an electron and a positron, right? How is energy from that event going to get to the detector? So the electron that's produced is just gonna create ion pairs in the lead. There's nothing weird going on, nothing special going on with the lead. So all those electron pairs are just gonna get recollected, recombined in the lead. What could the positron in the lead do? Annihilate. Annihilate. What is that annihilation gonna produce? Two gamma rays. Two gamma rays. How many of those two gamma rays could make it into the detector? One. One. Because remember, those two annihilation gamma rays come out at almost exactly 180 degrees. So one of them could get into the, detect de into the detector, but the other one would be going in the opposite direction, right? And even that one that makes it into the detector, if it, that angle is turned a little bit more where they're emitted, you might not get either one of those into the detector, okay? What's the energy of one single annihilation photon? Just minus 0.511 M or K, uh, MeV. Exactly 0.511 MeV or 511 keV. That's the energy of the annihilation photon, okay? And so if that annihilation photon gets into the detector, assuming it deposits all of its energy, that's going to show up as peak number three on our spectra here. Okay. So that's pair production. How else could a gamma ray interact within that lead shield? Photoelectric effect. Photoelectric effect. So gamma ray collides with the lead. Um, let's just say it ejects a K-shell electron. That K shell electron moves in the lead, it deposits all of its energy, whoop de doo. Okay. But what happens to that hole in the K shell when that electron was ejected through the photoelectric effect? It has to be filled. Has the to be filled. So electrons are going to fall down in. That means that it's going to emit characteristic X rays. Okay. Those characteristic X rays generally match the binding energy. It depends where the electron came from, but if you're thinking it came from a potential of zero and it came all the way down to the K shell, that's where we get those characteristic X-rays from, okay? Those X-ray energies will change depending on the type of shielding you are using. So if your shielding is aluminum or your shielding is steel, your X-rays are gonna be different than if your shielding is lead, okay? That X-ray still has to make it into the detector and that X-ray is gonna be much lower in energy than the photo peak of the gamma. That would be our peak number one on the spectra here, okay? Now, anywhere in the detector, anywhere, sorry, in the shield around the detector, the gamma rays could hit there, okay? And the gamma ray could get into the detector and they could scatter. They could undergo Compton scattering. Now, just to pick a value, let's just say your gamma ray goes straight through the detector without interacting, hits your backstop, scatters at 180 degrees, and comes back into the detector. That's going to kind of be your minimum energy of gamma that you can see from what is called backscatter. Okay? And that's represented by this second peak. So backscatter kind of as a minimum energy would be your 180 degree scatter in the Compton scattering equation. 
and you still see a little bit of a continuum there. It doesn't look as big as the whole Compton continuum because this depends very strongly on the angle of the radiation and the angle of the scatter. And not all angles that get scattered are going to end up in the detector, okay? So these are some features that you might see. The backscatter peak, it's gonna depend on um, your gamma ray energy, of course, and your shielding material to some extent, but it's gonna appear somewhere around, say, 0.2 MeV. Your annihilation peak is around 0.511 MeV. Your um, X-ray peak, again, that very strongly depends on your shielding material. That might be anywhere between, say, 0.05 MeV and 0.01 MeV. But again, it could even be lower than that. It kind of depends on what you're looking at. You guys have any questions right now about gamma spectra? So Lewis had messaged that you guys are doing some pulsite stuff next week, getting into some spectroscopy. This definitely is gonna make a little bit more sense when you apply it, but I wanted you to start thinking about it now. So would you generally just like us to know like where all these peaks come from and all the ways that gamma rays can interact in terms of like what's on the slide? Oh yeah, exactly. So okay. I don't know, let's say you're given a particular gamma ray energy you might be able to tell me what energies you might be able to observe from a detector. Or where, like you said, where specific peaks came from or what process created them. Would the gamma ray energy like on this graph, would that be what's on the x-axis? Exactly, and there's no energy listed there. It's kind of a dashed line because we were trying to focus on the other peaks. But um, yeah, that would be the photo peak. The energy would be on the x-axis. Okay. When you do spectroscopy for real, again, thinking about the electronics, you get this multi-channel analyzer that bends your energy pulses based off the voltage. And so initially when you're looking at a spectra, you see that in terms of channel number. And then you have to go through and do some sort of an energy calibration. And once you've calibrated your detector, then your detector or your spectra would actually be able to tell you the energy that you're seeing once you correlate channel number to energy, okay? So you would do that by like using a standard. You put a standard in that you know the energy of the gamma rays from, and you see what channels those end up in, and then the simplest calibration would just be two points, and you do slope intercept y equals mx plus b is your calibration curve to be able to translate channel number to energy, okay? But energy or channel number is always x-axis. Number of detected particles is always gonna be the y-axis, okay? Other questions about the gamma spectra? Yeah, I have a question uh, just about the Compton scattering for when it goes through a detector and then Compton scatters, I think fast scatter peak. You said what, if it has an angle of 180, it's the minimum. Right. Um, I was just confused. I think when we first learned it, was it 180 the maximum? So for the Compton edge, right, for the Compton edge, the energy deposited with the electron in the detector, that's from the 180, that's the maximum energy deposited in the detector. But in this case where it passes through and interacts within the shield, that would deposit the most energy in the shield, which means it would be the minimum energy that could get back to the detector with that gamma that scatters, okay? And you could draw that scattering happening anywhere around that detector. So you could have scattering angles of 90 degrees as well, okay? Other questions with gamma stuff? I didn't quite get the transit time for the three inch crystal. Um, that's just kind of like saying, hey, how long does it take light to move through three inches. <laughs> really, okay. really short, okay? Thank you. Yeah. So alpha, this is an energy level diagram for the Neptunium-237 nucleus. This is kind of complex. We're not gonna get into analyzing or knowing how to read everything on here at this point in time. There's information on here with spin and parity, You'll learn about spin and parity when you do nuclear structure, okay? Um, what is on here, what is important is that the americium-241 is decaying by alpha decay to the neptunium-237. 
right under the americium 241 on this diagram, what do you see given to you? Alpha. The Q alpha. So you're seeing the Q value for alpha decay. Okay, that's the whole energy that's uh, um, emitted, released by undergoing alpha decay. Now, that doesn't mean that's the energy that is with the alpha particle, okay? You've got the americium-241 parent, you've got the alpha particle and the neptunium-237 daughter. So that energy gets split between the alpha particle and the daughter. Did you guys talk about this last week? You did the kinetic energy thing. So you take the- And we talked about tunneling as well. Okay, cool. Um, so you have the mass number of the um, daughter over the mass number of the parent times the Q alpha gives you the T alpha, the kinetic energy of the alpha particle, okay? So even if you look on this graph, even if you look this level diagram, even if you look from the americium-241 all the way down to that bottom line with the neptunium-237, Keep pointing by hand. So here's the Q alpha. Even if you take this all the way down to the ground level of Neptunium 237, that alpha particle is not going to be 5,637.81 keV because a portion of that energy stays with the Neptunium. Okay, the alpha particle will be close to that, but not exactly at that level. Now, what you want to look at on this diagram for now is the percentages here. So here's an 85.2. Here's a 12.8, here's a 1.4. These are the percentages of decays that go to these energy levels of the Neptunium-237 daughter, okay? Those bolded numbers right there next to the percentages are the energies of those levels. We're not gonna worry too much about that other than to say that, hey, if you go from 158.51 all the way down to the ground level, that means you're losing 158.51 keV of energy, okay? You can look on all these little arrows from these arrows with, for all the, with these levels, all these little arrows with these little semicircles that go down. You can look along here and you can um, look at both the bold numbers and the smaller numbers. And I'm trying to find the one I want, there it is. So right here, that highlighted diagonal, there's a 36 in front. What that 36 means is that about 36% of the americium-241 decays are then associated with a 59.537 keV gamma ray, okay? So you can look for americium-241 using gamma ray spectroscopy, but that gamma ray, you can look along I don't think I see anything more intense. Yeah, everything else, all the other gamma rays are way lower than that in terms of intensity. They're way lower than the 36%. And there are a lot, some of them are, even though they're higher energy, their intensities are just so low. So americium-241, you could see a 59.537 keV gamma ray come off of that, but you're much more likely to be able to detect and see these alpha particles. So quickly, let's just run through and say, if we have this 5,637.81 keV Q value, what is the maximum energy that could go with my alpha particle. So this would be the decay to the ground state. Oh. Oh. Hmm. Oops. I'm trying to pull up my document camera. So let's say that's our Q value. 
we look at this tau alpha equals mass number of daughter over mass number of parent times Q alpha, then that means the maximum energy that could go with my alpha particle would be 237 over 241 times 5637.81 keV. or 5,544 keV, just rounding a little bit, okay? If you decay to a different level, then you have to subtract that level energy from the Q before you do the kinetic energy calculation. So if we're following that 12, that 85.2% decay that goes to our 59.537 level, we have to subtract that from our 5637.81 before we can find our other tau alpha, okay? It'll still be close if you don't remember to do that subtraction, but it will What, what is that, that doing again? So if you, this is decay to ground state, so alpha decay to ground. of that Neptunium-237, whatever this tau is, would be our alpha decay to that energy level. But um, where did that number come from? If you look on the right side of the americium 241 level diagram, the Neptunium-237 level diagram, you come all the way down to that 85.2% that I highlighted, that decay that it goes 85.2 of the 85.2% of the americium 241 decays go to that 59.537 keV energy level of the Neptunium 237. Could think of that like an isomer, right? Just representing like what is more likely to happen to the right. energy. Mm -hmm. okay. And so just taking that energy that we calculated, if we go ahead and look at the spectra that we might see, the spectra on the left here would be an example gamma ray spectra. There's our 59.54 keV, okay? And we can see that there's some lower energy ones, but their intensities are much less. One of the problems with trying to look at any of those other gamma rays, the 26, the 20 keV, is they're gonna start to blend into the uh, characteristic X-rays from our shielding material. And we may not be able to resolve those with gamma spectroscopy. So you could do gamma spectroscopy for americium-241, but you really would only be able to do alpha spectroscopy. Alpha spectroscopy, or if you wanted to get the, the best results you could get. So the alpha spectroscopy is shown on the right side there, and you should see there's a peak there that's 5.545. That would be an MeV, and that would be the energy measured of that alpha particle, and that matches up pretty much with the energy of the alpha particle that goes to the ground state of the Neptunium-237. You can see the largest peak there, the 5.486 MeV, and you should be able to match that up with the fact that that's the alpha particle that is emitted when the decay goes to that 59.537 energy. I'm noticing that the intensity of the peak doesn't necessarily correlate with its energy. Is that like for a reason? The intensity here for the alpha it correlates with the percentage of decays that produce that particle. So the higher the peak on your alpha spectrum, 
the higher the percentage should be when you look at that level diagram. So the highest peak on our alpha spectra is associated with that 85.2% decay, where about 85% of the decays go to that 59.5 keV level. That's why that one peak is the highest peak, okay? So you could look at the counts, you could look at the peak ratios, and that can give you information about the energy levels things are decaying to, okay? We can do the same kind of thing with level diagrams with um, gamma decays when we think more about looking at gammas for spectroscopy. So in the case of cobalt-60, it undergoes beta decay to nickel-60. Nearly 100% of its decays go to that top level, energy level shown for the nickel-60. And if you follow that through, um, almost all of those decays from that level will emit an 1173 keV gamma. And that doesn't go all the way to the ground state that goes to that first excited state for the nucleus. And that then emits another gamma of 1332.5 keV. So nearly all cobalt-60 decays are going to be associated with these two energy gamma rays, okay? And you could use those, you could use that information to identify your sample. For scandium 44M, this is a metastable nuclide. It can undergo electron capture and isomeric transformation in the remainder of its decays. Um, for freshly produced scandium 44M sample, sketch the spectra you would expect to observe. Okay, whether sodium iodide or hyperpure germanium, using typical efficiencies and assuming one megabecquerel of activity, assign energy labels to key features and explain their origin. How would these spectra change over time as equilibrium is reached? This is your first exercise question for this evening, okay? Your second exercise question is about neutron detection. So think a little bit about neutrons and the different ways they can interact with materials and what kinds of detectors you might use um, that would rely on each of these different types of interaction mechanisms, okay? So why don't you guys take another quick break? I know um, Dr. Boros is here for the next lecture, so let's not break too long. About about five minutes. Is that good? Is that enough time to break? Yeah, sounds yes. good. Okay. See you guys back here in five. <laughs>